Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Great. Uh, it's a great pleasure. Thank you very much, everyone, for attending today. It's a great pleasure to have with us Professor Judith Butler. Uh, we are very excited, all of us here. Uh, thank you very much for honoring us with, uh, with your talk at our series, Politics of Liberation. And uh, I know you're going to talk to us today about the slow power of liberation. So we all look very much forward uh, to hearing your talk. Please, the floor is yours. Okay. Um, wonderful. Um, thank you very much. I'm uh, very pleased to be here. I hope you can uh, hear me well. Maybe yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Uh, I am trying to adjust my screen so that I can read my, uh, it seems to be frozen. If you give me just one moment to handle a technical problem. Okay. Um, all right, we'll do it like this. <laughs> um, first of all, um, I'm very sorry not to be there in person, uh, but a combination of health and ecological issues has compelled me to use this technology rather than take a plane. And we'll see whether this technology serves me or whether I am its victim. Let's hope that at least for now it serves me. Um, I know that uh, discussing uh, matters such as liberation and the politics of liberation in particular work much better if it is um, an encounter and we can have a conversation uh, in person. I also know that um, on the Zoom, um, the sense of estrangement uh, and the loss of connection can feel acute. So I'm hoping um, to address the topic of liberation today uh, indirectly um, liberation is usually a liberation from something, and the desire for liberation uh, belongs to the more general desire to be free. Liberation is not only negative or privative, it is not only that we hope to be released from the shackles of patriarchy or capitalism, though we surely do, we also hope to be free to build a world, to build together the kind of world in which we can live, in which we want to live, where we can feel the desire to live. Thus, liberation belongs to the struggle for freedom. And freedom is not just marked by the absence of oppressive forces, but by the possibility of a collective kind of making the making of an inhabitable world. And when I say inhabitable, I do not mean only for humans, but I include all living creatures. Um, but for humans, uh, I call for a livable life, which includes work that connects us with each other, with the land and our potential futures. And when I use the word world, I also mean the earth, that is an earth that can and will regenerate itself. But of course, we live in times in which we see the earth destroyed by powers that seek to maximize their profits and to extend state control. We also see the attack on women, gay and lesbian people, trans people and migrants, Attacks which are focused on sexuality, gender, and race, sometimes religion as well, all operating in various parts of the world to support authoritarian structures, if not neo-fascist passions and politics. And yet, in our analyses of such matters, we rarely feature such attacks as constitutive elements of the new fascism. So here, I want to make two claims that are essential to the remarks that I have to offer you today. 
The first is that fascist passions are intensified and accelerated by attacks on women, LGBTQIA plus people and migrants, black and brown people and the poor. Secondly, those attacks appeal to the fear of destruction with which many people live now, not only workers who fear the loss of their jobs and the stability of their lives, but people forced into migration by the ongoing climate catastrophe. I suppose I would add a third point, namely that these attacks, whether they take the form of physical attacks, murder or legal disenfranchisement, also redirect the fear of destruction. If gender or migration are identified by the right as the cause of destruction, then they become the targets of destruction. If a nation can get rid of them or hold them in states of indefinite subordination or detention, then the apparent, the apparent fear of destruction can come to an end. Or at least that is one of the false promises of fascism, or perhaps not a promise at all, but rather a fantasy collective in nature and lethal in its effects. My aim today is to talk about the anti-gender ideology movement as a neo-fascist phenomenon, and to suggest that those of us on the left would be foolish at this moment in history to imagine gender as a secondary phenomenon. It is not. Indeed, it is one vector through which fascist passions are stoked and circulated. And those are the kinds of passions that support increasingly authoritarian regimes that justify their wars and their acts of destruction by appearing as if they are putting an end to what threatens society with destruction. I won't be giving a definition of gender today, nor will I be promoting a particular theory of gender, not even the one I offered nearly 35 years ago. The reason for that is that gender has become a phantasm. And so we have to think now about how this phantasm has been constructed and what we need to do in order to deflate and defeat the force and destructive power it wields within fascist discourse. <clears throat> For this, we need to create more firm bonds of solidarity, but also to create a vision that is finally more powerful, one in which the right to live, to breathe, to live together, to live as a body in the world becomes understood as a fundamental freedom, part of our politics of liberation. The best way to make the case for freedom is to embody that freedom collectively in ways that make freedom into the object of political desire. This means rejecting ideas of personal liberty based on property and self-interest in order to emerge into new collectivities. This is a slow process, especially considering all the disagreements on the left, but it is a necessary process if we are to but for the expanding circle of living beings to whom we are connected. Without those connections, none of us can live or live well none of us can even exist. The anti-gender ideology movement treats gender as a monolith, frightening in its power and reach. To say the least, the academic discussions of gender are not exactly followed by those who now oppose the term or call for the censorship or uh, de-departmentalization of gender studies. Even though it is true, some notions about what gender is have caused extraordinary alarm about its apparently dangerous and destructive powers. Quite apart from the mundane and academic ways that the term gender circulates, 
gender has in some parts of the world become a matter of extraordinary alarm. In Russia, it has been called a threat to national security. And the Vatican has said it is a threat to both civilization and to man. In conservative evangelical and Catholic communities throughout the world, gender is taken as code for a political agenda that seeks not only to destroy the traditional family, but to prohibit any reference to mother and father in favor of a genderless future. In recent campaigns in the United States, um, there, and of course in Germany now as well, uh, the gender is supposed to um, stay out of the classroom. Gender is treated as code for pedophilia or a form of pedagogy that teaches young children how to masturbate or how to become gay. The same argument was made in Bolsonaro's Brazil on the grounds that gender calls into question the natural and normative character of heterosexuality and that once that mandate is lifted or questioned, a flood of sexual perversities, including bestiality and pedophilia, will be unleashed upon the earth. Those kinds of arguments conveniently forget the long-standing hideous history of the sexual abuse of children by priests subsequently exonerated and protected uh, from any kind of punishment. In fact, the projection of child abuse onto those who teach sex education or provide trans health care is but one example of how the phantasm of gender works. Indeed, in various parts of the world, gender is not only figured as an omen of potential or actual child abuse, but it is also figured as a plot by urban elites to impose their cultural values on real people, a scheme for colonizing the global south by the urban centers of the global north, or a set of ideas that are in opposition to either science or religion or both, or, as I've mentioned, a threat to civilization, a denial of nature, a threat to masculinity, and the effacement of the differences between the sexes. It is also, it is also sometimes regarded as a totalitarian threat or the work of the devil, either the demonic itself or its contemporary instance and thus figured as the most destructive force unleashed upon the earth, or the contemporary and dangerous rival to God who must be countered, this rival, this demonic rival must be countered at all costs. In English, at least, gender is no longer a mundane box to be checked on official forms, and surely not one of those obscure academic disciplines with no effect in the world. On the contrary, it is a phantasm with destructive powers, one way of collecting and escalating a multitude of fears about destruction that are circulating in our times. Of course, there are many reasons to fear destruction. I fear destruction. There is climate destruction, forced migration, lives imperiled and lost in war. There are neoliberal economies that are depriving people of basic social services they need to live and to thrive. There is systemic racism that takes the lives of many through slow and quick forms of violence, taking the lives of women, queer and trans people, especially on the right, the list is different. What do they fear? Well, they fear the challenge to patriarchal power and social structures in the state, civil society, and kinship that uphold patriarchal power. They fear migration that challenges traditional ideas of the nation that challenge white supremacy and Christian nationalism alike. The list goes on. But no list can explain how fears of destruction are exploited by various movements, institutions, and states, or how gender in particular, or the teaching about systemic racism, 
are suddenly to be blamed for the acute sense of feeling imperiled that many people now report. For gender to be identified as a threat to life, civilization, society, the nation, and the like, it has to gather up a wide range of fears and anxieties, package them into a single bundle, subsume them under a single name. And as Freud taught us about dreams, whatever is happening in phantasms such as these involves the condensation of a number of elements and the displacement from what does not want to be seen or named. I wonder if we can even say how many contemporary fears have gathered at the site of gender. Or can we explain how the demonization of gender deflects from and covers over fears about climate destruction, intensified economic precarity, war, environmental toxins, police violence, fears we are surely right to feel and think about. When gender becomes a phantasm for the contemporary right, the various conditions that give rise to fear lose their name as gender both collects and incites those fears, keeping us from thinking more clearly about what we do have to fear and what we do not. Circulating the phantasm of gender is also one way for existing powers, states, churches, political movements to frighten people, to come back into their ranks, to accept censorship, and to externalize their fear and hatred onto vulnerable communities. They not only appeal to existing fears, this is the right, they appeal to existing fears that many working people have about their future, the future of work, or the sanctity of their family life, but they incite that fear, insisting that people identify gender as the cause of their feelings of anxiety and trepidation about the world. Consider the incitation of Pope Francis in 2015. After warning of the existence of Herods in every historical period, he uh, remarks um, that gender theory consists of contemporary Herodians who, and I quote, plot designs of death that disfigure the face of man and woman, destroying creation, end quote. He then makes clear just how annihilating the force of gender theory is. And I quote again from Pope Francis. Let's think of the nuclear arms, of the possibility to annihilate in a few instants a very high number of human beings. Let's also think of genetic manipulation, of the manipulation of life, or of the gender theory, single, the gender theory, that does not recognize the order of creation, end quote. Pope Francis continues with a story about how funding for education, for schools serving the poor, has been provisioned on the condition that gender theory be included in the curriculum. Well, we're not given any idea about what is meant by gender theory, but it clearly is supposed to be feared as one would fear the massive loss of life. To require the teaching of gender in schools is, in his words, ideological colonization. He adds that the same was done by the dictators of the last century. Think of Hitler youth, end quote. Give you a moment. The Vatican's decision to use inflammatory rhetoric of this kind is, of course, quite destructive, given the influence of the institution and the generally high esteem in which Pope Francis has been held. If gender is a nuclear bomb, it has to be dismantled. If it is the devil itself, all those who represent gender must be expelled from humanity. What he says is clearly preposterous and dangerous, um, but I don't cite him here to make fun of him. No, I am trying to understand his inflammatory rhetoric as a tactic. Whether figured as a nuclear bomb, the devil, a new version of totalitarianism, 
pedophilia or colonization, gender has, ass has assumed a startling number of phantasmatic forms, eclipsing both academic and ordinary usage of the term. As a consequence, circulating the idea of gender's destructive powers is one way to produce existential fear that can be exploited by those who want greater state powers to fulfill the promise of a return to patriarchal order that will reestablish a secure order, or perhaps they want greater church powers, or perhaps they want a stronger alliance between state and church powers. The fear is stoked so that authorities who promise its alleviation can then enter as forces of redemption and restoration. The fear is both produced and exploited in order to rally people to support those who would destroy the concept of gender, the field of study, as well as the social movements and the public policies that use such a term or are organized by such a term. Rolling back progressive legislation is surely a kind of backlash but backlash only describes the reactive moment in this particular scene. The project of restoration is different. It promises a return to a patriarchal dream order that may never have existed, but which occupies the place of history or nature, one which only a strong state or a strong church can restore. The shoring of state powers, including the powers of the courts, implicates the anti-gender ideology movement in an authoritarian project. The targeting of sexual and gender minorities as dangerous to society, as exemplifying the most destructive force in the world, um, uh, serves the, the, uh, the call the authoritarian call to strip such minorities of their fundamental rights and freedoms, including their protection from harassment and violence. And it implicates the anti-gender ideology in fascism. For full license is given to the state to negate the lives of those who have come to present, we might say through the syntax of the phantasm, a threat to the nation, the most destructive force in society. In taking aim at gender, some proponents of the anti-gender movements claim to be defending not just family values, but values themselves, not just a way of life, but life itself. The phantasm that fuels fascist tendencies is one that seeks to totalize the social field and infuse the populace with fear about its existential future or exploit its existing fears through giving a totalizing form to its cause. It would be tempting to say that gender is simply an empty signifier because it no longer refers to anything we might understand as gender or because it attracts and mobilizes fears from several orders in society, including the economic and the ecological. But it is less empty than it is overdetermined bearing a number of accretions from social history and political discourse. In addition, gender designate in the popular imagination some way of living the body. So life and the body are its topics, its zones of passion and fear. Um, and where life and the body come into play, so too as hunger and illness, vulnerability, penetrability, relationality, sexuality, and violence. In the life of the body, the distinct or differentiated life of the body is already under the best of conditions, a psychological anxieties cluster where social norms take up residence. Then all the sexual and social struggles in life find a location and incitement precisely there as much as gender is about so much more than gender in the anti-gender ideology movement. So gender is still very much about the senses of embodied life formed and framed by social conventions and sometimes by psychic disturbance. 
to be told, as Italian uh, Prime Minister Giorgio Meloni has told the Italian and Spanish publics, that the advocates of gender will strip you of your sexed identity. To be told that is to stoke a fear and outrage among those whose sexed identity is fundamental to their sense of who they are in the world. To exploit that manufactured fear for the purposes of stripping trans people of their rights to self-determination is precisely to mobilize the fear of having one's sexed identity nullified in order to nullify the sexed identities of others. The very fear of being deprived of something so intimate and defining as a sexed identity depends on a general understanding that this deprivation would be terrible for anyone. Indeed, it would be wrong to deprive someone of the sexed aspect of their very being. From this premise, it should be possible to then universalize the claim and to refuse to engage in any activity that would deprive people of their sexed identity, including trans people. But the opposite has proven to be true when the right to my own sex requires that you lose yours, right? So trans people in selecting their own sex or determining their own sex will take away your sex, you people who uh, live with the sex assigned at birth. Um, but of course, to be deprived of your own sex is terrible. And yet to deprive trans people of their sex is not terrible. You can see how the logic works or rather fails to work. The task before us is to try to understand such an accelerating inflation and bundling of potential dangers and to ask, how can we possibly counter a phantasm of this intensity before it moves yet closer to eradicating reproductive justice, the rights of women in the workplace or against harassment or rape, trans and non-binary people, their rights, gay and lesbian freedoms, and all efforts to achieve gender and sexual equality and justice. How can we counter this before it joins the frenzy of censorship targeting critical race theory, post-colonial studies, and ethnic studies, to name a few? We could, of course, provide very good arguments by what, about mm, why looking at gender in this way is simply wrong. Um, and then we could circulate those arguments for educators and policymakers, um, and they could use them to explain why they retained the term gender and even find it valuable. We could also try to give a history that accounts for how gender came to be regarded in this way, paying attention to both its secular and religious versions, noting how right-wing Catholics and evangelicals have overcome some of their differences in their battle against this common enemy. All of these approaches surely are necessary, but they can hardly account for or counter oppose the phantasmatic force that gender now carries. This phantasm, understood as a psychosocial phenomenon, is a site where intimate fears and anxieties become socially organized to incite political passions. What is the structure of this vibrant and distorted phantasm called gender, and by what aim is it animated? Finally, how do we develop a counter-imaginary strong enough to expose its ruse, scatter its force, and stop the efforts at censorship, distortion, and reactionary politics um, that, it, uh, um, that it has created. In addition, it is up to us to produce a compelling counter vision, one that would affirm the rights and freedoms of embodied life that we can and should affirm. For in the end, it is a matter of affirming how one loves, how one lives one's body, uh, how one understands the embodied right to exist in the world without fear of violence or discrimination, to breathe, to move, in effect, to live. Why wouldn't we all want people to have those 
fundamental freedoms. If the right opposing gender, if they are gripped with fear, overwhelmed by the threat of a dangerous phantasm, then we can't really just use logic or give a critical history of how this all came about. Maybe we're not in a public debate at all because there's no text in the room, there's no agreement on terms, and fear and hatred has flooded the landscape where critical thought should be. We are rather in a phantasmatic scene and referring to a phantasmatic scene, I adapt the theoretical formulation of Jean Laplanche for thinking about psychosocial phenomena. For Laplanche, fantasy is not simply the product of the imagination, a wholly subjective reality. It is in its most fundamental form uh, a syntactical arrangement of elements of psychic life. Thus, fantasy is not just a content of the mind, a subliminal reverie, but rather an organization of desire and anxiety that follows certain structural and organizational rules. Much could be said psychoanalytically mm, to distinguish between conscious and unconscious fantasy, but here I would suggest that the organization uh, or syntax of dreams and fantasy is at once social and psychic. Although Laplanche was interested in infancy and the formation of what he called an original fantasy, I am asking whether we can appropriate some aspects of his view to understand anti-gender, the anti-gender ideology movement as a phantasmatic scene. My wager is that we will be better able to respond to this movement and its discourse by framing the matter this way. For when the scene is set and something called gender is imagined to be acting on children, academics or the public in nefarious and destructive ways, then gender has substituted for a complex set of anxieties and becomes the overdetermined site where the fear of destruction gathers. It would be perhaps a perverse form of flattery to imagine uh, that gender is just a very powerful concept um, and that those of us who have worked in gender theory are responsible for making it so powerful. <laughs> I think that's not true because the power attributed to gender is not generated by gender studies or any of its theories. It is attributed to gender uh, by those who need gender to uh, fulfill a certain function. Um, anxiety, desire are bundled into an inflammatory syntax in which some foreign element wields enormous power to destroy social structures as many have known them, the family, the nation, civilization, and man itself. Gender then, considered as a public phantasm, bundles all these issues together, treats them as a coordinated and concerted movement and ideology attacks them as a monolith. This bundling operation is what marks the object of their opposition as a phantasm. In fact, um, where I live, at least, the term gender oscillates between the ordinary and the, ca the catastrophic. Depending on where one lives or how recently the term has come into use in one's language, um, it can be construed as a dangerous uh, phantasm by those who seek to preserve patriarchal forms of family and state. One increasingly publicized fear is that certain academic fields of study have become modes of left-wing indoctrination. And I know that in the Greek universities, you are also having to deal with arguments such as these. Gender studies is sometimes characterized as a dangerous ideology inflicted on an apparently susceptible and vulnerable student population from grade school through university. The youth, it is said, need to be protected from gender. In the US, 
there's been a frenzy of recent Republican legislative efforts in the US claiming that to teach about gender is a form of ideological inculcation, seduction, and pedophilia, as I've mentioned. It is also seen as a plot, um, uh, a form of colonization by superpowers or the invasion of migrants from poor or war inflicted countries. It is an unwanted migrant, a foreign term that gets through the border. Um, although interpreted as a backlash against progressive movements, it's driven as I've suggested by the wish to restore a patriarchal order where a father is a father, a sexed identity never changes, and women conceived as born female at birth or assigned female at birth, resume their natural and moral positions within the household and white people hold uncontested racial supremacy within society. Now that uh, patriarchal restoration project is a fragile one since uh, as we know, the patriarchal order it seeks to restore never quite existed in the form they seek to actualize in the present. The past they seek to restore is a dream, a wish, even a fantasy of a patriarchal ideal that will reinstate order grounded in patriarchal authority. The recruitment of communities into the anti-gender ideology movement is thus an invitation to join a collective dream, perhaps even a psychosis that will put an end to the implacable anxiety and fear that afflict so many people experiencing, say, climate destruction firsthand or ubiquitous violence and brutal war or expanding police powers or intensifying economic precarity. Of course, stoking a desire for a restoration of masculine privilege serves many other forms of power, but it constitutes its own social project to produce an ideal past whose reanimation will target, if not eliminate, sexual and gender minorities. This shoring up of a phantasmatic promise um, that an ideal patriarchal order from the past will reappear as the future shape of society implies or rather requires the negation of fundamental rights and freedoms of women, gender and sexual minorities, the indigenous, black and brown people, the disabled and the poor. The restoration dream not only seeks to restore a rightful place for masculine privilege conceived as part of a natural and or religious order, but it aims at rolling back progressive policies and rights to make marriage exclusively heterosexual, to insist that whatever sex is assigned at birth stays in place throughout the entirety of one's life, that abortion becomes restricted because the state knows better what limits should be placed on pregnant people's bodies than any of those people. The backlash that we see is, I'll say it again, part of this larger restoration project. And both work to shore up, to support authoritarian regimes as rightful forms of paternalism, the dream come true. And as I've said, the fantasy of restoring patriarchal power works as a mobilization technique only if the people to whom the appeal is made have ready wishes and fears to exploit. The mobilization of anti-gender sentiment by the right depends on the credibility of this dream of the past. No one is providing historical documentation about this patriarchal, patriarchal order that needs to be restored to its rightful place. whose syntax reorders elements of reality in the service of a driving force that does not always make itself easily known. The dream works in waking life only as a phantasmatic organization of reality, one that offers a range of examples and accusations to shore up the political case it wants to make. It hardly matters that historical documentation is not supplied. 
it surely does not matter that the argument that is made is riddled with contradiction. The incoherence and the impossibility of the case against gender represents, yes, contradictory phenomena, and even offers its public a way to collect many of its fears and convictions without ever having to make that bundle coherent. Gender represents capitalism. Gender is nothing but Marxism. Gender is a libertarian construct. Gender signals the new wave of totalitarianism. Gender will corrupt the nation like unwanted migrants, but also like imperial powers. Well, which one is it? The contradictory character of the phantasm allows it to contain whatever anxiety or fear that the anti-gender ideology movement wishes to stoke, to incite for its own purposes without having to make any of it cohere. Indeed, the liberation from historical documentation and coherent logic is part of the escalating exhilaration that feeds the fascist frenzy and rallies around forms of authoritarianism. The phantasm can be found in a wide range of movements against progressive legislation. It arrives on the main agenda of Christian nationalism in Taiwan, the presidential platforms in French elections, also in Colombia. Um, it is there in the rallying for a defense of European racial purity, national values, and the natural family, but also in the conservative critique of Europe and its gender mainstreaming policies, that is, its neoliberal agendas. Wherever it operates, it brings with it sadistic elation about being freed of new ethical constraints putatively imposed by feminist and LGBTQIA plus agendas or their mainstreaming apologists. The anti-gender agenda is buoyed by the excitement of depriving lives of what they require to live, including fundamental and intimate freedoms and access to those legal, medical, and educational resources that make life livable. By criminalizing and pathologizing sexual and gender minorities, refusing to recognize the historically shifting character of our embodied and sexual lives, censoring books and policing curricula, uh, threatening or actually closing down departments of study, the anti-gender ideology movement supports forms of institutional sadism in the name of divine or human morality, warding off the devil, incest, pedophilia, protecting the nation's patriarchal order from state to family and civilization. Um, what is remarkable and disturbing is of course the way that this moral campaign relishes experimenting with various ways of denying the very existence of others, stripping them of rights, denying their self-definitions, restricting their basic freedoms, engaging in shameless forms of racial hatred, controlling, variously demeaning, caricaturing, pathologizing, and criminalizing those lives. Hatred is stoked and rationalized by moral righteousness and all those damaged and destroyed by such hateful movements prove to be, alas, the truer agents of destruction. The projection and reversal structures the phantasmatic scene of gender. And this leaves us with an urgent question. Who is out to destroy whom? And how do forms of shared and escalating moral sadism pass themselves off as morality or a virtuous order? The methods and arguments liberated from standards of historical evidence or logical coherence are as various as they are inciting and damaging. It matters not that the targets of anti-gender ideology include an array of groups who are not always in alliance with one another. Uh, the targets include, as you know, trans people, including especially trans youth seeking legal and social recognition and health care. Anyone seeking reproductive health care whose manifest priority is not to consecrate the heteronormative family. And that includes anyone seeking an abortion and many seeking birth control. 
all those waging equal wage campaigns, all those working to pass and conserve laws opposed to discrimination, harassment, and rape, um, the efforts on the part of lesbian, gay, bisexual people to secure legal protection for themselves, and those struggling to exercise freedoms of expression and movement without fear of violence, punishment, or imprisonment. The opposition to gender, conceived as a demonic social construct, culminates in policies that seek to deprive people of their legal and social rights, that is, to exist within the terms that they have rightfully established for themselves. The attack is against their autonomy, their equality, and their lives. Stripping people of rights in the name of morality, or in the name of the nation, or in the name of a patriarchal wet dream, belongs to the broader logic amplified by authoritarian nationalism to deny migrants rights of asylum, to displace the indigenous from their own lands, to push black people into the prison system where rights of citizenship are systematically denied and abuse and violence are justified as legitimate security measures. The restrictions on freedom abound, whether through establishing LGBT free zones in Poland or strangling progressive educational curricula in Florida that address gender freedom and sexuality in sex education. The opposition to gender is a refusal to imagine or accept that the categories of women and men shift historically and contextually, and that new gender formations are part of contemporary historical reality. I hate to break the news, but this simple fact is what is being denied. To deny these facts, the historical and contextual meanings of women, men, the possibility of other categories describing gender, to deny this or to try to outlaw this is, of course, a futile effort to negate a living complexity, a living solidarity that will not go away in the years to come. But there, there will be a battle, and there is a battle. Of course, no one is imagining the future very well these days. And when we try to imagine the future, it feels like a nightmare. We're not sure what to call fascism anymore. On the one hand, the term is bandied about too easily. On the other hand, we would be wrong to think that all of its possible forms have been exhausted historically and that we can only call something fascist if it conforms to the established models. No. Imagining the future is, of course, not exactly a prediction. Imagining does not only take place in the mind. It's more like the release of a potential through a sensuous medium. The medium not as a simple vehicle for an idea, but the medium as something where an idea takes hold and where the medium itself releases a potential from within its own materiality. No one really wants to imagine the future except those who imagine their businesses expanding and their capital increasing, who see the future as the horizon of their own expanding power. But to think that way is not really to care whether that form of accumulation comes at the expense of the earth, other lives, and life in all its forms. And yet in our acts and practices, we do implicitly reproduce an idea of the future, whether or not we know precisely what it is. We live this way now, assuming that living this way is the way we live. And once that repeated practice converges mm, uh, into a way of life, a shared way of life, um, that way of life is reproduced. And at some point, it looks like the way things are or ought to be. And yet when the way of life that is reproduced destroys all ways of life, including its own, one has to ask how the pursuit of destruction is carried out by a way of life that is considered to be the way things are or have to be. Climate destruction is perhaps the most terrifying example or uh, terrifying uh, in a way that is close to war or equal to war, I'm not sure. It teaches us not only that many now live with a fear of destruction that their way of life has helped to produce. It teaches us also that many 
have no idea how to live with that fear of destruction, which is not only a fear about what will happen in the future, but what is happening now and has been happening for some time. We look, we look away. We know, we fail to know. We live in the anxiety produced by knowing that we are not knowing what we know. And what about war, the actual one waged against Ukraine? Do those of us who live outside that region know that destruction? What does it mean not to know it, even to know that it is unfathomable, exceeding the reach of knowledge? Or the decimation of peoples who live in the Amazon, who are dying and predicted to die off by virtue of corporate extractivism? And what about this pandemic and the ones to come that have so many people living with the sense of ambient death that they know neither how to mark nor mourn? And consider neoliberalism and the decimation of such social and public services, what they call austerity in your part of the world, the increasing, increasingly precarious character of work, the withdrawal of healthcare, retirement rights, um, protections against eviction. All this underscores the increasing dispensability of lives. Over 80 million people are forcibly displaced from their homes right now, and approximately one in eight live in global slums. The devastations of capitalism would take many books to catalog, and they are being cataloged by uh, great uh, uh, writers and scholars um, on the left. And yet the sense of destruction, the destruction of what is most valuable, is being felt by people all the time, either as something that's already taken place or as an ongoing process or as a terrifying prospect or all of those things at once, contaminating, we might say, every temporal order. Many of us live with this sense that our lives too are dispensable or could become so at a moment's notice, that we could find ourselves in unpayable debt or bound to banks for life securing their profits without being able to afford shelter. <clears throat> and what about all those who did not know whether there would be affordable or accessible health care or any prospect of stable work that would secure the condition of life for ourselves and those with whom we are in interdependent during the pandemic? The displacement of fears from their conditions of production climate disaster, systemic racism, capitalism, carceral powers, extractivism, patriarchal social and state forms. All this results in the production of cultural figures invested with the power to destroy the earth and fundamental structures of human societies. Precisely because that destruction is happening without being properly named and checked, the fear and anxiety congeal around matters of gender, sexuality, race, migration, without a proper vocabulary or analysis. And what ends up happening is that gender or critical race studies is targeted as the cause of contemporary destruction. Let us remember that the killing of women, trans, queer, bisexual, intersex people is an actual form of destruction taking place in the world the killing of black women, black queer and trans people, the killing of migrants, including queer and trans migrants, all these are destructive acts that we can enumerate and must. And as those numbers increase, it becomes apparent whose lives are considered dispensable and whose lives are not. The inequality of the grievable makes itself known. And once gender comes to include abortion rights, access to reproductive, justice, um, sexual health services, trans rights, women's freedom and equality, queers of color freedom struggles, single parenting, gay parenting, new kinship outside of heteronormative models, adoption rights, sex reassignment, gender confirming surgery, sex education, books for young people, books for adults, images of nudity, well then, Gender represents a wide range of political struggles that its opponents seek to shut down in their effort to restore a patriarchal order for the state, religion, and family. The only way forward is for all those targeted to gather themselves more effectively than their en enemies have gathered them. We have to recognize our alliance and to fight the phantasms 
prepared for us with a more powerful and regenerative imagine, imagine, imaginary. Fascist passions or political trends are those that seek to strip people of basic rights they require to live. And to do this, either without regard for their probable demise or because it is an effective mode of annihilating those lives. Authoritarianism is usually understood as a form of state power, and yet authoritarian personalities flourish within elected positions, stoking fascist passions, where the fear of destruction converts into a moral alibi to destroy other people's lives. The authoritarian who seeks to stoke fascist passions knows too well that the fear of destruction already courses through those who have seen the destruction of the climate, the land, the environment, the destruction of labor unions, the prospects for financial security. It is inflamed and organized by anti-gender ideology that locates destruction as emanating from foreign and elite powers engaging age old conspiratorial logics to prop up anti-democratic regimes. If the foreign sources are characterized as Jewish, then that is apparently all the more effective in converting the fear of destruction into fascist passion. Perhaps it will not actually be arguments that will address the fear of destruction that motivates the anti-gender ideology movement and that accounts for its partial success. That movement taps into a sense of a world on its way to destruction and incites the fear of destruction to rally support for its destructive plan. There is hardly an instance of the movement that does not claim to be saving the children from harm. The movement finds, stokes, and organizes that fear wherever it can. Nothing could be more personal and singular than the fear for one's bodily safety or that of one's children or those who are most proximate. Most painful is the fear of being injured, killed, pathologized, or incarcerated on the part of trans kids who are hurt by this movement that claims to be saving the children. Equally painful is the fear that women feel on the streets as they seek simply to live their lives and move freely without fear. To realize how many women and LGBTQIA plus people are seized with fear on the street, in the workplace, or in their homes is, or shelters is to know how pervasive and corrosive that fear can be. It matters how many black and brown people undergo that fear in proximity to the police or the store owner who regards them with suspicion. How many young black people in the US, for instance, have their breath choked out of them by self-justifying police. It is a singular fear for one's life. And at the same time, it is also someone else's, the one that someone felt before they died, the one a parent felt when they sent their kid for groceries at the corner store and the kid never comes back. What if political movements were forged from all those who fear discrimination and violence in public and private spaces, who demand to live and love freely without fear of violence. Perhaps then the fear of destruction could be identified in a way that shows how its fascist exploitation is so egregiously wrong. Um, uh, in, in May of 2022, just prior to her election as the prime minister from the right-wing party, Georgia Meloni attended a rally in Marbella, Spain with Vox, the Andalusian reactionary party, to warn against the threat to Spain and to Europe more generally by the Greta Thunberg ideology, the Green Deal, and other forms of climate fundamentalism. But the worst threat, she intoned, remains the ideologia del gender, which suppresses the difference between masculine and feminine and which is dedicated to the disappearance of women, who knew, the death of the mother, and called, she called, Georgia Maloney, called on women and mothers to rise up and fight against this ideology. Her discourse then veered into a vicious caricature of North African migrants abusing children. What was the link between gender ideology and the North African migrants abusing children, unclear, 
the ideology of gender is perhaps like the migrant invasion, since both threaten the traditional family and its task of reproducing the ethnically pure family and nation. The slide from one topic to the next without, transi without transition suggests a metonymic link between the two. Gender is an unwanted and abusive migrant. North Africans are bringing abuse to Europe. We are, Europe is not abusing North African migrants, no, the other way around. Both are threatening the nation and Europe itself. Gender and race intertwine as a phantasm that threatens national identity. Only toward the end of her remarks did she add an apparently obligator, obligatory reference to Goldman Sachs, who she argues has no place in Italy. And Meloni, who we know entered politics at age 15 by joining a group of ex-fascists, the youth front of the Italian social movement, she claims she wants Jewish finance out of the country. But is it Jews as well? It sounds like it. She continues in her speech to associate Jewish finance and progressive intellectuals, presumptively Jewish, Islamic fundamentalism and the secular left. They are all bundled together without contradiction. She opposes them all in the name of the people understood as Western, Christian, European, heteronormative. Along the way, she yelled out a few times, no to gender ideology, yes to sexed identity. One could conclude that the fear of being economically destroyed or destroyed by the environment has been displaced onto gender. And that would be partially true. I have tried to make that case today. But there is a reason that it's gender that attracts specific anxieties rather than some other term. Even if the oppon opponents have not read much, they understand that gender relates to their embodiment, their forms of intimacy, their sexual way of life, the limits under which they live and imagine the potential ways of living or loving um, that prohibitions make more vivid and frightening. If the taboo against homosexuality is trespassed, then does that mean that sexual taboos, including those that rule out sex with children and animals will also be lifted? Some fear the flood of unlicensed sexuality, the fear cascades from one taboo to another, liberating the sexual imagination into specters of terror until a fully lawless sexuality or unbridled sense of entitlement is imagined that would destroy all social bonds. It is thus crucial, I think, that gender politics oppose um, uh, all the forms of devastation and destruction that are actually with us today and not become their instrument. That is to say, gender politics, and I ask you to join me here, um, has to oppose uh, the continuation of colonization and all forms of racism, including those afflicting migrants. It has to take its stand within an expanding alliance of that kind. It cannot be an identity politics and still create the world in which we all want to live. It is by virtue of our interdependency that we stand a chance of surviving and flourishing. Can we make alliances that reflect that interdependency with both human and non-human life, one that will oppose climate destruction and stand for a radical democracy informed by socialist ideals? For a critique of financial coercion and cultural imperialism to become an integral part of a transnational gender politics, we have to remind people why and how they desire to live reclaiming life for the left, finding life in the relations that sustain us, the alliances formed among all those who seek to realize equality and freedom within a livable world, an enduring and regenerative earth. And this means living with our profound differences without succumbing to the destructive forms we must oppose. The only way out of this bind is to ally the struggle for gender freedoms and rights with the critique of capitalism and to formulate the freedoms for which we struggle as collective ones. To let gender become part of a struggle for a social and economic world that eliminates precarity and provides healthcare, shelter, education, and food across all regions of the world. 
such an agenda, such a politics would develop an understanding of the formation of the individual within a social world. The individual body as bearing the trace of the social and its relations with others, both actual and implied, a body at once porous and interdependent. It would mean accepting that as human creatures, we persist only to the extent that we are bound up with one another. So when we say, I want to be free, or I want you to be free, we are talking about, yes, these distinct selves that you and I happen to be, but we are also talking about social freedoms that should be accorded to everyone as, as long as no real harm is done. And for that caveat to work, we have to expose the fear mongering that would recast fundamental freedoms as harms and make freedom into a new and vital object of desire. To live according to such a maxim means that uh, we would have to distinguish between actual harms and those that grip the imagination as imminent possibilities. But we cannot learn to choose how not to cause harm if freedom itself is regarded as a harm or if we become convinced that struggles for equality, freedom, and justice are somehow hurting the world. They are not. Let us show instead that the world, the earth, depends upon our freedoms and that freedom makes no sense when it fails to be collective, no matter how difficult staying in fraught emancipatory collectives uh, might be. Um, let me then just uh, move to the end of my remarks. Um, when I uh, say that the anti-gender um, ideology movement is fascist, or when I refer to fascist trends, I'm talking about political trends that are either death dealing or rights stripping. And they deal death or they strip people of rights in the name of defending family, state, uh, church, other patriarchal institution. And they support strengthening forms of authoritarianism. And this is why it makes no sense for so-called gender critical feminists to ally with reactionary powers in targeting trans people or non-binary people or genderqueer people. Despite our differences, we must stay in the struggle. And this is why our emancipation will be slow because the differences between us can be intense. We have to test our theories about the other by listening and reading by remaining open to having one's traditional suppositions challenged and finding ways to build alliances that allow our antagonisms not to replicate the destructive cycles we oppose. We cannot oppose discrimination against ourselves only to support it against others. We cannot oppose systemic forms of hatred against one group by allying with those who would intensify that hatred in multiple directions. We cannot censor each other's positions just because we do not want to hear them. It is no time for any of the targets of these fascist movements to be petty and divisive. For to defend gender studies and the importance of gender to any concept of justice, freedom, and equality is to ally with the fight against both censorship and fascism. Okay, we are not seeing fascist states on the order of Nazi Germany, but even that history, the history of that fascism, advises us not to deny the fascist potentials that are being increasingly actualized in several regions of the world through the anti-gender ideology movement and its adjacent movements. Had Trump or Bolsonaro successfully destroyed the electoral systems in order to stay in power, we would be clearly speaking about authoritarianism. But what about fascism? Well. If we establish typologies according to fascist regimes, according to which fascist regimes can be identified and none of the existing regimes fully fit the criteria, should we then set the issue of fascism aside? Well, no, fascism emerges over time. So we need to know the steps by which it emerges and to identify fascist potentials when they appear so we can oppose them. Such a procedure does not imply that fascist potentials materialize only as fascist regimes. But if readiness to resist is imperative, then we have to identify what is happening and intensify the resistance to its momentum. Uh, 
alliances become the counter imaginary to those destructive phantasms that the right has produced. Ours will be on the side of life, love, and freedom, making those ideals so compelling that no one can look away. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Butler. That was enlightening, and I think it was also tremendously necessary because we also face uh, these tendencies in Greece. They have almost accelerated in the past, uh, in the past, I would say, four to five years because, you know, what has been called gender revolution is something very recent in Greece. I would say in the past three years, we have seen an acceleration uh, in the realm that pertains to gender rights, LGBTQA plus rights, as we have never seen them before because these trends have arrived late in Greece, while at the same time we see a very, very strong backlash from right and far right forces, and another trend, the instrumentalization of identity politics by the right uh, and the right in government uh, at this moment. Uh, so, uh, you know, both the problems within the left, uh, the, the inability of the Greek left to embrace gender claims uh, has also led to that condition where the right right now presents itself as the proponent of rights while at the same time uh, pushing an agenda around uh, gender rights, abortions, uh, and all the other aspects of uh, those reactionary politics that we see also in the US. But before we uh, take the privilege, we have the privilege to ask you questions, George and I, let's open it uh, to the public. If there are any questions, please use the microphone for the recording. Thank you. Hello, and thank you for your time and everything. And I just, well, I just wanted to ask, and um, basically to maybe sum up in my head. So basically everything, the destructions, the killings, the wars, the exploitation, everything can be limited, or maybe not limited, but um, this, um, well, it, it, it happens because of the political concept of a security dilemma in realist terms, because you've mentioned uh, multiple times that, w well, basically, these bad things that are happening in the, in the world because of the phantasm of the gender and, and its projection onto people and entities happen because of well, the fear of what it can do to het heteronormativity standards, I guess. Yeah. Um, great, thank you. Um, well, you you raise the the question of security, uh, which is uh, uh, quite quite a large notion, and we. Uh, we know security can pertain to the borders, but security also now uh, is a, a, an issue of health, uh, sec you know, securing the health of the public, but, you know, um, also um, uh, uh, security is used to uh, disperse demonstrations. <laughs> security is used to um, keep people at home or, uh, regulate their movements on the street. I mean, security can operate in many ways. Uh, it's Putin who um, in 2015 actually uh, said that gender was a threat to the national security of, of Russia. And his argument is one that um, I think uh, many authoritarians today are using, namely uh, that whatever gender is, it. Uh, will destroy the family, and by destroying the family, it destroys the reproduction of the state um, as a specifically national state. Um, in his language, 
it threatened the spiritual values of being Russian, right? So it will be the, the end of Russia and his uh, way of referring to Europe as gay ropa, you know, the European influences will come in through Ukraine and uh, there will be this gay uh, destruction of the Russian family. And of course he's turned against gay and lesbian trans people for sure within Russia. Many of them have been expelled or lost their jobs in the last um, in the last years, as we know, it's been intensified under the war. Um, at the same time, I'm learning that Zelensky has closed, uh, has allowed for some gender studies programs to close. So he has his own nationalism that he's stoking. Um, but when we talk about security, uh, we have to really ask what is being said. Uh, are, are we really talking about uh, an attack from the outside? Is, are migrants an issue for security? Why would they be an issue for security? Um, uh, gay, lesbian, trans people, or their, uh, or the, the studies that have emerged around sexuality or gender, to what extent would those be threats to security? How is security being figured? So it's a very labile term and we have to learn how to distinguish its, uh, its usage uh, in order to push back against it as a, um, a rationale for, for censorship or uh, social control. metaphorical sense in a way in a way that uh, the, the concept of security in dilemma is, is used in international politics as being scared of losing status quo or even your power I, I mean it in these terms maintaining a hetero a heteronormative status quo uh, not <laughs> uh, well of, of course security I, I it can be extended to um, well, physical security, but I mean it in uh, m metaphorically in maintaining or increasing, maintaining status quo or increasing your power as a heteronormative structure. Yes, well, I, I, I hear you. Um, I think uh, we have to choose between uh, status quo or Hegemony. <laughs> I mean, status quo is like, oh, this is just the way it is. Um, uh, the, the, if you see what I'm saying, but, but hegemony is really, the, the, it needs to stay this way. Um, uh, it needs to, or dominance, full domination, right? This is the only way it can be, which is very often what the religiously fueled anti-gender ideology movement says. This is the only way, heteronormative arrangements are the only way it can be. It is nature, it is civilization. They will take, it is biology, it is history. They will take any rationale to firm that. So, um, I mean, status quo is interesting as a term, right? Because we think, oh, this is just the way things are, but actually it is being imposed and there are severe consequences for uh, contesting it. But I, I, I follow, I think, what you're saying. Thank you. I mean, what's what's weird is that the literal and the figurative they're that similar. issue they're they're both they're, there. Yeah. They converge in the political discourse, right? That's what's that's why it's so confusing. That's you know, it's deeply confusing. The same fear I might have about you know a bomb coming at me uh, from the sky from a, an enemy state is the the fear that I am told I should have about gender theory. So. What is happening between the physical sense of a security threat and the metaphorical sense that is being mobilized politically that makes me fear gender or race studies or something like that in the same way? Um, you know, it's a tactical convergence, we might say, of the metaphorical and the literal. Thank you. Is there another question? Yes, please. Hi, thank you very much for your talk and your work in general. Um, I don't even know how to phrase the question I'm about to try to phrase. It's, it's, 
it's just kind of my thoughts around how how do you think we should approach conversation with politically opposed ideologies in terms of, because you mentioned the importance of cooperation, conversation, stuff like that, especially given how polarized um, politics is at the moment. And also at other times in your talk, you talked about our struggle, our need for revolution, our need for opposing, stuff like that. So I guess my thought is in conversations like these with people who tend to have, I don't know, fascist ideology tendencies say, because the conversation is very emotionally charged, both for us on, on a needing, you know, I'm right. <laughs> kind of, yeah, th this sense of this has to do with our security, this has to do with our safety, this has to do with our survival and lives and stuff like that. But also on the other side, the, the, it's experienced in exactly the same way emotionally, like you said, because everything is so relative, everything is so charged, these traditional family values as a concept, say, they're so emotionally charged. Then I guess in trying to go further back in the conversation, because of you can't really go through the logical contradictions way, because it all has to do with emotion then you, you get back to the axioms of which lives are legitimate and are not in each person's view, I guess. But given that very often it's masked, this, this admitting of no, these lives are not valuable, is masked under so much because there's so much guilt there. And if that were to be admitted, blah, blah, blah. So if that were to be admitted, you would need a space in which the person would feel I don't know, safe enough, I guess, to be able to admit that they hold these, these beliefs. But it's I don't know. It's just a question of how do you think the best strategy is in approaching these conversations from uh, having to cooperate and to agree on some things, but also trying to fight, I don't know. <laughs> how can we work together in having these conversations productively, I guess? Yeah. OK. Um, well, let me make a distinction. Um, it would be one thing to have a conversation with a number of fascists. Um, oh, fascists, let's sit down and have a conversation. <laughs> uh, I don't, you know, I don't really do conversations with fascists um, to tell you the honest truth, right? I, I won't do it. I, I know some of my German friends say, well, we have to, you know, they, they're running for state assembly. We have to stop them. And well, you have, you have, you have fascists right there in Greece, and you, I'm sure, have made decisions about whether or not to be in conversation with those people. I can't do that. I, I will be in conversation with conservatives if they're willing to uh, discuss a topic where we actually read or we have a common set of text, something or a, an issue that we're, it is defined. I will, I will, I make a distinction between uh, conservatives and fascists. Fascists I, want, I don't want to argue with them. I want to defeat them. And we need to simply make larger alliances more powerful, more desirable, so that we can defeat them. OK, that's what you do with the fascists. You defeat them. Um, what I am worried about is um, on the left and within feminism and feminism, gay, lesbian, trans, this, you know, these fights, this is nonsense because the, the right is coming for all of us, right? It's coming against trans rights. It's coming against abortion. It's coming against feminism. It's coming against gay and lesbian parents. It's like, I mean, of course we disagree. And I could, uh, it would be hard for me to have some conversations, but I, um, I do think we have to find some way of, overcoming this, not by agreeing, not by agreeing, but by remembering that there is a, an emergent fascism that is terrifying, uh, that is coming for all of us. And we really do need to find some ways of being in difficult alliances, because right now, um, the so-called uh, trans-exclusionary feminists are, are using the same arguments as the right. And maybe Maybe they are not part of the left. Maybe they are not part of a struggle for freedom. Maybe they're not part of a struggle for equality. Maybe they don't care about other people 
suffering discrimination. Maybe they only care about what they define as women, a very narrow idea of what women are. Uh, those women suffering discrimination, or they're so frightened of, be, of that their identity is being taken away. They, they use the same language as Meloni. Like they're coming to take away your sex identity. It's like, well, why? There's a trans woman here and you are assigned female at birth and you like your assignment. Like, why can't you live in the world with this other woman? What is what is the problem of sharing a world of people who are assigned a sex at birth or who take on a sex in time? Oh, really? really? That person is stealing from you? No, that person's not stealing from you. That person's trying to live and you're getting in their way. So, you know, these... Um, these attacks, uh, I think, are very painful and unnecessary, and I feel like they they lose the vision of what the true danger is in this world, this world that is in the midst of being destroyed, but they also become part of a destructive cycle. It's like, oh, well, we can destroy too. Um, it's like, what logic are you repeating? And in your action, are you creating the world you want to live in or are you destroying the world you want to live in? I really think we have to ask that basic ethical question, even as we struggle uh, with others with whom we disagree within, <laughs> within hopefully the non-fascist left. Thank you. Are there any more questions? Is there anyone? Yes, please. Thank you. Um, let's see if I can express myself well. Um, the question is about our own alliances uh, against this threat. So I'm, I'm trying to um, take the issue of security and um, think about our own security, but this feeling, this fear that we have that our security uh, is threatened. And because of because our own security is threatened, we also sometimes um, use the language of the right, um, not in a fascist way, let's say, but um, we, for instance, deny multiplicities of e experiences of being, wo being a woman or a lesbian or trans um, and because this threat is so huge and it's so scary that we also feel we have to hide in a fort and sort of hold on to a singular, say, gender theory. So we will adopt this idea of being, the being, there's only one way of being trans, there's only one way of being a woman, there's only one way of how, you know, how we think of gender theory. So I guess my question is about our own alliances and the language we use, especially, say, in the presence of social media where uh, things get inflamed really fast and it does, it does have a reality of its own uh, that imposes upon our own reality. Um, so how do we build a language of nuance, which I fear we're losing? Um, it, it just feels very difficult at the moment with facing such a big threat, such a big uh, fearful threat that we, we can keep on, keep, we can still hold on to our nuances, we can still hold on to our um, particular slow arguments. So I, I really appreciate that you, you know, um, emphasize the word slowness, um, but how do we hold on to the slowness and, and nuances? I find it very difficult. Um, yes. Um, all right, I'm, I'm trying not to make a joke about being too old to help you, but okay, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll try my best. Um, I actually think that uh, social media accelerates passions um, and it's no accident that the right-wing Citizen Go platform and many of the anti-gender ideology platforms are um, are very wise about the algorithms and they are able to produce bots at extraordinary speed and um, produce the effect of a massive movement sometimes even when there isn't one and then that in turn does produce one. Um, so there's a lot of acceleration that happens through social media. Um, the reason why I say I'm too old is that <laughs> I'm not on social media, although all the young people in my life obviously are. Um, 
but the question is how to work, how to do slow thought or slow down accelerated fighting uh, among people you care about, right? Who should be in alliance. Okay, we're not talking about the fascists, although we have to think about that too. But at least for the solidarities we need, how to, sl how to do a slower kind of communication on social media. I mean, there are some places that allow you a long form or that allow you um, uh, to, um, uh, to experiment with image or words or film and produce something, an online uh, 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 for, form of art or uh, photojournalism or um, photo uh, essay that allows for a, a number of points of view. Sometimes a really good graphic novel can do that <laughs> uh, or, a, or, or, a, or a smaller one um, that can be online in a different way. That, we, we need to think about different ways of using these platforms that move against the acceleration. Um, because the acceleration, sometimes it sometimes it's great. It gets the word out about something that's happening or gets people to rally or gets them to move to a certain place and appear in a demonstration. It's great. But sometimes that acceleration uh, creates a, a truncated or even false idea of reality and then incites fears at a very quick rate that can't be interrupted. So how do we interrupt acceleration online? That's a technological problem that I believe generations other than my own, uh, or maybe some savvy people my age can help with. Sorry, I promised myself I wouldn't joke about my age, but okay. <laughs> Are there any further questions? I do have a question in the meantime, in case there are more questions. Professor Bravo, thank you very much for also allowing us to put our thoughts in order in the sense that we all sense what's happening, but we can't necessarily systematize it and, uh, and theorize it. My question and my concern is that emancipation is indeed slow, as are sometimes fascist behaviors so as fascism as a mentality, that's what we see in Greece. We see the mainstreaming of the far right and mainstreaming of uh, fascist ideas around gender, around migration in particular uh, in Greece. Uh, and despite the fact that the fascistization of societies is Again, uh, it's a process. This is not something that happens overnight. I feel that that process is much faster than mm. the process of emancipation. And in some cases, I feel that there is an urgency here. Uh, I mean, we have felt it uh, since, um, I mean, if I take the example for Greece, but I believe that there are similar experiences across Europe and in you know, my understanding in the US as well, this process has been immensely accelerated in the past three years, two to three years, especially you know, during COVID, conspirational thinking, which is central, uh, it's a central mode of far-right thinking, of fascist thinking, has been taking over also parts of the left in Greece. It may not necessarily be expressed around gender so openly, but we still hear it every now and then, oh, things are getting too far, you know? Uh, we kind of like get that discourse. So what do we do, despite the fact, you know, we know, I, I, I think I totally agree that emancipation is a slow process, but what do we do when we face an urgency? And I feel that yeah. we are, we are facing an urgency in, at least in Europe right now. It's, I think you are, and I think we are as well. It's a, it's a different formation, but they are linked. Um, and they're actually linked through certain organizations that have been linking them for some decades, unfortunately, <laughs> including the World Congress of the Family and things like that. Um, but, um, you know, um, actually think the question you're posing is one that has to be posed collectively, that we, um, because I'm, I'm not a Leninist and I, um, uh, 
I don't I don't under, I don't think that there are like people who can tell you what to do and then you do it or make the five year plan or whatever it is. But um, I actually think there has to be a collaborative form of thought. Um, seminars like yours is a, a small example of that, but a collaborative thought in which we put that question at the center, right? What public squares and what public platforms are available to us to do that? You know, it might be art spaces, it might be public squares, it might be online platforms. I don't know, maybe all of those. Like what would it mean to have an initiative that just continued to gather people? If we look at some of the most effective um, political movements in Latin America right now, including uh, the Ni Una Menos uh, feminist movement, uh, they they just went and had assemblies in factories and <laughs> they, they had all the, um, uh, a janitorial staff, uh, women who are struggling there. They they met with trans people. They met with they went into churches. They went into all kinds of sites where the left usually is not. Certain trade unionists are with the janitorial staff. But when 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 do we see feminists coming to help organize women workers um, or to talk about what their fears are and what's going on? Um, and these kinds of sites, these gatherings, you know, they they had the capacity to um, bring people into the street who'd never been in the street before. And, and at, a, at a certain point, there were three million or five million people on the street throughout Latin America at the height of that feminist mobilization, which is far from over. Um, so, you know, these are ways of having, you know, conducting assemblies of parliaments outside of parliaments. There are, extra parliamentary forms of political uh, discussion. They don't have to be in academic quarters. And I think the, the academics need to leave the building <laughs> and learn how to talk in different ways uh, and be part of a conversation with activists and artists. And you know, it, we need to expand those circles and pose the very question you're posing so we can come up with a collaborative answer. I mean, if I were to answer you, then I would be the subject who knows and you would like take notes or say I'm wrong. But I'm actually, uh, as I say, not a Leninist. I'm a horizontalist, but maybe that makes me worthless, but that's okay, I don't mind. Thank you very much. There's a question over here, right, Natalia? Can, can we have the microphone, please? Um, for the very insightful presentation. We need this kind of uh, discussions in Greece, Athens, uh, particularly since 2015, that things have been slowing down in terms of like collective forms of, you know, reacting and organizing ourselves. Um, in continuation to what Rosa mentioned, I find myself on the opposite side and um, it's a worry that I have the last 10 years for the Greek left wing and the European left wing. And it's like, why do we find ourselves always um, <sighs> behind uh, the things that are going on, trying to react into urgencies and not being able to form like adequate agendas in all these forefronts that they are at stake, environmentalism, um, I don't know, uh, the future of work in terms of like algorithmic, like surveillance and uh, um, domination. And um, I was thinking like also how technology and added, added, added gender ideology can somehow be part of this um, fascist agenda. For example, I'm not really sure uh, all this fertility industry or this, um, data-driven bioeconomical things that they're happening and they kind of accelerated themselves like during the COVID. And we saw what happened with Pfizer and all these uh, uh, health tech companies. How they can be also part of like an alt-right agenda that they are not purely libertarian in terms of economic you know, um, uh, ideology, but they can be part of alt-right agenda. And like I, I feel that um, when we always have to respond into this urgency when as a left left wing we haven't managed to find a way to have these difficult alliances because for me what you mentioned I, I kept this point I found it like really really interesting why we can't really have you know these sensual licenses 
in the left wing. Um, and um, yes, why why we have to be reactive always, and why we are not we never found like this space to be able to have a more positive or um, uh, how can I say all encompassing agenda in place. I, uh, I think my internet is a little unstable suddenly. Hopefully you can hear me. Yes, okay. we can. Uh, okay. Um, well, I, th I think um, emancipation has to be something deeply desirable. And I, I couldn't really lay that out today, but my, it's, it's why uh, sometimes liberation Liberation is a term that has always been very exhilarating to me, like, yes, liberation. Um, but the desire to be free or to live in a free way or the desire that for collective freedom or a desire that is produced within uh, alliances and solidarities, that's a different kind of desire. Um, and I think to make our ideals desirable, right? I mean, we shouldn't be functioning as centers, we should actually be producing desire for the kind of world we want to live in. And to do that, we, we need to have very, very powerful, um, our critiques of corporate power, our critiques of capitalism and of patriarchy, I mean, they can be very persuasive, but what are we saying about the world we want to build? And that, that needs to be much stronger. Um, um, and I, uh, I actually believe artists have to be part of that practice. <laughs> um, and, um, you know, social theorists and econ economists and curators of this, um, we actually need like found collaborations to uh, make a persuasive case and not an ideological indoctrinating case, but a persuasive case of the kind of world we want to live in, why, why we want to check or destroy corporate powers that are destroying the earth or why uh, what we think international migration should look like or what should should what should those laws look like if we even think there should be laws how would how would we formulate them we need st stronger aspirational form and I, I i think we're beaten down we see that we're, we are um, we are struggling here again i i must say that my own politics changed by going to Latin America and seeing the uh, enormous, uh, I mean, we had the Chilean election, maybe uh, it's very temporary, but uh, because we know what happened with their constitutional reform, but um, several incredible uh, laws passed in Argentina, uh, and some great uh, changes in Honduras recently. I mean. These are mass mobilizations that where people really want their freedom and they come out to express it in common and they understand it as a common reality. Um, I, I think I think we, we have to find ways of doing that. It doesn't always have to be in a public square in some traditional way. It's but it, it needs to happen. It needs to happen transnationally. So I, I agree, it, the worst thing that could happen to the left is to become purely reactive to the assaults by the right. Um, we need to make our vision of the world more desirable and also to name uh, what is truly destroying us in a more persuasive way. Sorry that, that I can't be, give you a fuller answer to such an important question. Are there any more questions from from you? Yes. Hello, I'm George. Um, so um, I thank you for your inspiring talk. And um, I found very interesting what you said, you know, that uh, you reshaped your politics after your visit in Latin America. I mean, I would be interested, you know, to listen how, in which ways this happened. I mean, how 
uh, um, you know, which was the example that inspired you. Uh, and the second thing is that I would like to ask uh, is that mm, uh, you referred and you named it uh, uh, in your talk as something that was anti-gender politics. Uh, the ideology, yeah. Uh, why you don't, I mean, um, you don't think that, I mean, it's a kind of um, reconceptualization and the kind of uh, instrumentalization on behalf of the far right of a spe specific project about, uh, uh, you know, the nation, the, the nation and the gender. So it is, I mean, it is a kind of a hegemonic shift. I mean, I don't know if you conceptualize this kind of thing in that way. Yeah, this is my question. Um, well, let me answer the first part of your question and then I might need some clarification on the second part. Um, I mean, one of the things I saw in terms of the alliances that were being formed uh, throughout Latin America is um, the struggle for indigenous rights, the struggle against extractivism and neoliberal economics, the struggle for uh, women's rights and freedoms, the struggle for trans rights, the struggle for gay and lesbian uh, equality and freedom, the struggle against violence, violence against women, against trans people, against gender non-conforming people, against gay and lesbian people, against poor people and the indigenous, that struggle against violence had, I mean, the alliances are clear. And the feminists don't always agree with the trans or the lesbian, gay, the, you know, the indigenous, you know, there are many differences that are not exactly overcome. They are they are lived with and they there are continuing struggles, but state violence, neoliberal economics, uh, uh, violence on the street, police violence, uh, violence against uh, gender minorities and women. I mean, the, this, it was really clear, like what the problems are here. Um, and that focus kept people in alliance, even when they, didn't always agree or didn't always fully understand each other. Um, they understood they, they were suffering or they were in a position of vulnerability or subjugation or exploitation. And they made links on the basis of that without necessarily becoming one subject, right? Uh, so that was impressive to me. Because if you go to the UK right now, I mean, uh, they're feminists trying to shut down other feminist university departments or trying to censor certain books from the... They're, they're f this internecine fighting uh, that is just so painful. And they're not looking up and out to ask, like, okay, what's happening in this world? Who, who are all the people who are being uh, uh, sacrificed you know, through these policies and through these state policies and through these systemic forms of violence. Uh, they're, they're not asking that question. They've become so terribly narrow and actually replicate in some of their own fights uh, the, the same destructive logic that I'm trying to point out as being a, a, a really uh, 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 unjust and wrong uh, uh, for formation of politics. Um, so and so, it's no wonder that some of them end up aligned with right-wing uh, positions. It, I, we, we need to stop that. <laughs> Which doesn't mean we have to love each other, but we do need to stop that. Um, the hegemonic shift, I mean, I would say uh, that, of course, there has been huge progressive legislation but also gender mainstreaming through the European Union and other corporations and international bodies that um, have produced a kind of conflicted situation for many countries where in order to enter the European Union, you have to accept their anti-discrimination laws, even if those offend you or, or work for your own particular local culture. Um, and so, being told that to get money or to enter a market 
had to get a loan or to enter the market in order to survive economically it means you have to accept certain cultural values feels like extortion or um uh, yeah extortion uh, for some especially eastern european countries who are really angry uh, and that kind of gender mainstreaming we have to remember is not is not the radical feminist or radical queer um, that it doesn't come out of those grassroots movements they're really they're they're different kinds of uh of issues that emerge uh, once NGOs and state structures or even uh, uh, federated structures like like the European Union take over. Uh, and gender gets tarred in a way with those um, uh, neoliberal economics. So I mean, I think there is another way to approach this um, Agnieszka Graf in Poland has done some really excellent work talking about reactionary conservative uh, resistances to gender that and that are primarily resistances to the EU and its neoliberal uh, agendas uh, and its forms of extortion, which Greece, Greece knows. Also. So, you know, that's another way to approach this issue, and maybe that would take it closer to the question of hegemony that you're you're posing. Are there any more questions? We can take one more question if you want to. Okay. Well, if there are no further questions, please join us in thanking Professor Butler. Uh, for this great talk.